Okay. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing all of our wonderful instructors this evening. Um, and it looks like, oh, here we go. Uh, so first we have Pita Brooks, who is a versatile multimedia artist whose creative journey spans a diverse array of materials, showcasing traditional mediums such as painting, photography, and encaustic, while also fearlessly exploring new media genres like audio, video, installation, and performative works. Pita Brooks' artistic trajectory has been enriched by her extensive experience across various roles in arts administration. Her notable career paths include working at distinguished organizations like Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland and the Cleveland Institute of Art. Currently, Pita holds the role of art um, as executive director at Akron Soul Train, a gallery that stands as a testament to artistic innovation and community enrichment. We also have Katie Butler, a painter in Akron, Ohio. Her allegorical still life paintings provide critical <coughs> commentary on American politics. Recent exhibitions include Abattoir Gallery in Cleveland, Ohio, Tuesday to Friday Gallery in Valencia, Spain, the Krasl Art Center, St. Joseph, uh, Michigan, Tchotchke Gallery in New York, New York, uh, Stephen Zevitas Gallery in Boston, and Hashimoto Contemporary in Los Angeles, California. Her 2023 solo exhibition at Hess Plateau, uh, New York, uh, was featured as a must-see exhibition in Art Forum, and her work has appeared in New American Paintings, Juxtapose, uh, Canvas Cleveland, and the Can Journal. She was recently awarded an Elizabeth Green Shields Foundation grant and participated in the inaugural Summer Artist Residency at Alfred, Alfred University in D uh, Dusseldorf, Germany. Uh, Butler received her BFA from the University of Akron in 2017 and her MFA from Kent State University in 2021. And then last but not least, Nick Lee is a painter and 2021 Kent State University graduate. Lee lives and works in Akron, Ohio. Uh, his work is inspired by the di diversity of human experience. As a Japanese American, Lee's visual art strives to better represent minorities like himself in American portraiture and Western art. Another motivation for Lee is self-discovery. He uses symbolic Japanese objects in his paintings to connect with a culture that was never taught to him growing up. Lee is the 2023 recipient of the Distinguished Citizen for Art Education for the Northeast Ohio region. So we have some amazing people with us tonight. And I love that we're starting out by reading their bios because you can see how they're amazing writers. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Katie, Pita, and Nick. And um, thanks again for being here, everyone tonight. Um, okay, can I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So give me one second here. Um... want to make sure and everybody can see that Natalie you can see it great um so I'm just gonna start with the first couple of slides and then we'll move on um I'm Peter Brooks I'm from Akron Soul Train and actually hilariously listening to you read that whole thing I was like hmm, maybe that's too wordy <laughs> so as we'll go through we'll talk a little bit about that um but so we're uh one thing I just want to touch on really quick before we go through all of the slides is that to apply to anything, applications, call for arts, exhibitions, commissions, every process is going to be a little bit different and they're going to want different things. So we want to focus on three major components of that you will find in most applications, um, calls for art. And those three things are, you know, the first thing would be an artist bio, which is, um, you know, kind of a factual account of who you are written in the third person. So it usually would be like, PETA studied at such and such a school and she focuses on blah, 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 blah. Um, then there's the artist statement, which is about the art. Basically, why are you creating what you're creating? Um, you know, talking about your artist philosophies, practice and content. And then the third thing that is a major component for applying for a lot of different things is the actual project proposal. And this is different than the artist bio and the, you know, the artist statement. Um, this is actually what you would be doing if you were to be awarded this grant or this residency. And so these are the three things that we're going to be focusing on today. So we're not going to be focusing on every little component in every application anywhere, but um, 
These are three things that if you have these in your toolkit, then you have a big chunk of the work that's done for a proposal in advance. So I just wanted to start by there. Um, I also want to show a short video because I want everybody to open their hearts to the idea of loving writing about yourself. <laughs> and so um, we're going to start with this before we move on to Katie. It's been my experience that uh, if you're a creative person and you're good at one thing, you're probably good at another thing. If you're like, if you're good at drawing, you might be good at writing too. If you're good at writing, you might be good at playing music too. If you're good at playing music, you might be good at pottery. You know, if you're good at, if you're good at, um, if you're good at playing guitar, you might be a good dancer. In order to create, there's some little thing you have to let happen inside yourself of just letting yourself be free. And um, if you can turn that little switch on inside yourself, um in one medium you can probably do it in another medium i mean the the main inhibitor for uh create for for creativity is just being scared um you're worried that what you're going to do is not going to be good enough and if you're worried that what you're going to do is not going to be good enough then you just don't do it um i mean that's what writer's block really is people say i don't have any ideas it's not that you don't have ideas you got tons of ideas you're afraid your ideas aren't good enough so, you know, major obstacle to writing is sometimes fear. And it's always, you know, I don't have anything to talk about or I don't know how to talk about my work. And you you probably do. And so we're going to talk a little bit about tips and tricks to get over some of these obstacles. So I'm going to kind of toss the um, presentation over to Katie and we'll move on. Hi. Yeah. Um, and thank you for that video, too. I, I hope it does open things up a little bit at the start here. Um, I know that writing and especially sharing your writing um, can be a little intimidating at times. So hopefully that helps to alleviate a little bit of the pressure. Um, so I want to hone in on artist statements, that particular component for a bit, because they're kind of like a core feature of pretty much any application, along, of course, with the artwork itself. Um, and then we can talk about uh, the other components it's a little bit more um, in depth and then just sort of how to package it all together and what comes next. Um, but uh, an artist statement is is one thing that you'll probably need for pretty much anything. Um, if you're applying to a residency or a grant, uh, if you're proposing a project or exhibition, if you're applying to a degree granting program, uh, you'll need an artist statement. You might also need it um, in cases where uh, maybe someone's writing about you and your work for a magazine and they need some context. Um, so they ask you for a statement or maybe you're showing with a gallery and they're trying to write a press release. So they ask you for a statement to provide more context. So there are all kinds of different situations in which you might need an artist statement. And each situation will probably call for a different type of artist statement. So I just want to go over, you know, a couple of different types of statements um, and documents that you'll need. So a full page statement is approximately two or three paragraphs, um, and it's a general overview of your practice. So it's going to speak about your ideas, intentions, methods, techniques um, in in depth, um, but it can apply sort of holistically to your, your work and your practice. Um, this is a good statement to just have on hand at all times and um, to keep updated, you know, as your work grows and changes, because you can take this and you can pare it down or make it more specific to um, meet the needs of uh, whatever it is you're applying to. Um, some applications will require you to cap the statement at a certain word count, like 200 words or less. So you really do need to be able to distill your thoughts and your ideas and get your point across in one short paragraph or, you know, maybe even a few sentences. So uh, it's good to have a short statement on hand, which is essentially just a concise version of that long form statement. It is still a general overview of your work and your practice, 
but it's pared down to include just the most important aspects, you know, just the key points. So again, it's good to have one of those on hand and edit continually, update along with your work. And then um, if you're applying for something specific, you might need a project or exhibition statement. And um, this is going to vary in length um, and it's gonna vary from application to application, but the main point is that it's gonna be more specific. So you can take your um, general overview statements and that can be a place to start. And then you can expand upon that a little bit to talk more specifically about a particular project or body of work. So this might um, be necessary if you're applying for a residency and proposing a specific project. Um, it might be necessary for say a solo show where you have um, just a specific group of pieces, um, you know, a certain series. Um, so it gets into the specifics a lot more. And then a bio is something different than an artist statement as PETA touched on. So sometimes an application will call for both a bio and a statement. Sometimes it will ask you to combine the two into one document, but either way, just know that they're different. Um, a bio is more about you. The statement's more about your work. Um, a bio is pretty short, usually just one or two paragraphs and it's just a brief summary of your CV. So it should include basic biographical information, like where you're based and your education, and it should highlight your major accomplishments. So any major shows you've been in, um, maybe grants you've received um, or residencies you've done. It's, uh, it's not your life story. Um, it's a little bit more formal than that. So just consider it like your resume in paragraph form. Um, so I think we can move to the next slide um, and talk more about the artist statement particularly. So before we get started with it, I want to just address a couple of common misconceptions about an artist statement. Um, first of all, an artist statement is not a static unchanging document. An artist statement is something that you should edit often. Um, so consider it to be fluid and malleable. Um, your artist statement is about your work, which is something that is continually evolving, right? So your statement should continually evolve alongside your work. You want your statement and your work to align. So whether you're actively applying for things or not, it's good to revisit your statement often as you're making the work and just let it grow and change just as your own work does. Um, the other point I wanna make is that an artist statement is not a one size fits all document. Um, it would be so much easier if it was and so much less time consuming um, but unfortunately, uh, you can't always just copy and paste and submit the same thing over and over. Um, first of all, some applications will require different things or maybe ask you to address a certain question. So you'll have to make some adjustments there. But in addition, it's good to just tweak it anyways to um, you know, cater it to whatever opportunity you're applying to. Um, think of it kind of like a cover letter where you might be working with the same ingredients, but you are um, crafting a different recipe for like a specific person. Um, so it's a little bit more work, uh, but, and I'm sure Peter can speak to this as someone who reviews applications, um, but if you do take that extra time to rewrite your statement um, specifically for the opportunity in which you are applying, it will make you a much stronger candidate. So the main takeaway here um, is to just write often um, and write uh, continually alongside your work. So with that being said, uh, I wanna give you just a few tips on writing. As you get into your statement, um, maybe you're writing it for the first time or you're workshopping it or tweaking it for something new, um, just consider these five basic tips on language. So number one, be concise, avoid unnecessary jargon 
or really flowery language. It should be short, sweet, and to the point. I've seen statements where it feels like there's a lot of words, but they're not really saying anything. So try not to be overly descriptive and try not to repeat yourself. If you're saying the same thing over and over in a slightly different way, that's not very productive. If you're just kind of piling on adjectives but not really adding any substance, that's not really productive. So um, try your best to keep it concise and to the point. A good tip for this is to try to write in your own speaking voice and then read it aloud back to yourself. If it sounds repetitive or unnatural, disjointed, then um, that's a good sign that you might want to tweak the language a little bit to be more concise. Um, number two, be assertive. So um, don't use passive language like, I hope my work does this, or I'm trying to say this. Um, just state what you're doing. Have confidence in what you're doing and what you're trying to say, and be really clear and direct with that language. Um, three, be honest. So you want to make sure that your statement and your work really match up. Um, so don't try to attach meaning to the work that isn't really there. Um, if you feel pressured to make some kind of grandiose statement, um, don't, don't just be honest, you know, um, be honest about what you care about, what you're doing, um, why you're doing it and, um, allow that all to come through clearly in the statement. Ultimately, your statement needs to back up your work. So just try to be honest and, and don't make it into something that it's not. Uh, four, be specific. So avoid really vague statements like, my work explores memory. Uh, that's a really broad topic. So ask yourself, what is it about memory specifically that you're interested in? And then ask yourself why. Um, and then just keep asking yourself questions until you get to the crux of the matter. You know, what's really important there. Um, and then lastly, just keep it relevant. Try to stay on topic and avoid anecdotes that don't really have any relevance. Try not to go on any tangents. Uh, you don't need to give us your life story unless it's really relevant to the work, maybe. Um, so, for example, if you're making work about, say, language and identity, and perhaps you grew up in a bilingual household, it could make sense to talk about that experience in your statement and how it influences your work. But if um, your work really doesn't have anything to do with your upbringing or your personal life, then there's no need to write about it in the statement. So just be sure that you're only including information that is really intrinsic to your work. Um, so on the next slide, I have just a few more tips on writing um, uh, that talks about process and just kind of how to get started. So you can begin just by asking yourself pointed questions. So interview yourself about your work. Um, pretend like you're going on a studio visit and um, you're just trying to get to know the person and their work. Ask yourself things like, what am I trying to convey in my work? What influences me? How do things like materials, technique, style, formal decisions, how does all of that help to get my message across, you know, help to carry the content? And then ask yourself to identify some specific examples of that in the work. Um, so if you're using color to explore a certain idea, um, point to a specific painting or sculpture where that's happening, and you can start to talk about that a little bit with more specificity. Um, so it's good to try to sit down in front of your work and do this. Um, just ask yourself questions about what you see um, and what you're trying to do. Uh, and then it's good to maintain a sketchbook or a journal. Uh, when you're in the studio and you're making work, just take notes alongside. Jot down words or phrases that come to mind um, during the making process. 
there might be um, a really good descriptor or adjective that comes to mind when you're in the middle of making something and it might be gone tomorrow. It might be gone when you leave the studio. So just jot it down in the moment. Um, that way you can go back and you can find that adjective again. And then take notes after a studio visit or a critique or even just a conversation with someone about your work. Um, I think that's really helpful. Sometimes I find that someone will come into my studio and they'll say something and I'm like, that's the word, you know, that's the word I was looking for. So jot that down. And then um, you can go back through those notes when you write your statement um, and pull out some of that language. Uh, that brings me to three, which is research. Uh, I think it's a really good idea to look at artists who make similar work to you and who are at stages in their career that maybe you hope to be at soon or are at. And then do as much research as you can about them and their work. So read their artist statements, um, read press releases for their exhibitions, um, read reviews and uh, interviews with them, and um, do that as much as you can for every artist. Go to as many artist talks as you can and, and just read um, publications as much as you can. The more that you take in, the easier it's going to be for you to build a vocabulary and develop language to better describe your own work. You might find some kind of description um, in somebody else's statement or a review about someone else's work um, that has relevance to your work. You don't want to plagiarize, of course, but you could um, maybe borrow and reframe and, and piece things together and, and make it your own. So it just gives you some vocabulary. And then Four, I suggest that you maintain records um, throughout the writing process. So as I've noted, your artist statement is something that you want to revise regularly. And I recommend keeping all of the previous iterations. So whenever you go to write a new statement or, or tweak one, I would just save and date the old one first, because you might want to go back and refer to those at some point. Maybe some of the language that you use to describe past work um, becomes relevant again in the future. So it's just good to have all of that on record somewhere. And then finally, phone a friend. Just ask for help. Uh, ask someone to go over your statement or um, see if you can read it out loud to them. This is a really good way to see if you're getting your point across clearly. Um, they might read your statement and go, uh, I don't really get it. Or, you know, I don't really see that in your work. Um, so it's good to get a different perspective. And it's good to just get out of your own head sometimes, too. So um, I think we can move to the next slide um, and start talking about a um, way to sit down and develop a framework for your statement. Um, I teach painting and drawing, and I often encourage my students to work general to specific. And I think that approach applies to writing too. Um, it's good to try to come up with an overall structure, like a general framework. And then you can build upon that um, and kind of craft your statement around like a few key points. So I'm going to have you all in a few minutes here do a quick little activity that will hopefully help you generate a basic framework to build a statement upon. So the three kind of main ingredients of a statement are the what, the why, and the how. So um, in order to uh, generate a framework that kind of touches on all those things, um, you can just start jotting down answers to those basic questions. Um, and you can start very simple, you know, and get a little bit more complex as you go along. But um, starting with the what, here you can just kind of describe your work and describe what you see. So um, what are you making? You know, are you making paintings or sculptures? You can start very basic. Um, what are you making paintings of? Uh, what kind of imagery are you using? Is it portraiture or landscape? Maybe it's abstract. Um, and it's all about shape and color. Um, 
but just look at your work and uh, very simply describe what you see. And then think about the why. So why are you making those things? Um, if you're making portraiture, why are you making portraiture? Um, what are you interested in here? What are you trying to convey? Uh, why is this content important to you? Uh, and again, you could start, you know, very basic um, and then work your way up to some more detail. And then think about the how. So you have what you're making, you have what you're trying to say. Now you can think about how um, the, the artwork that you're making is getting that message across. So how are you using imagery? How are you using materials or techniques? Um, what kind of formal decisions are you making in the work? Um, how does all that help to um, get your idea across? So, and again, you can start basic, like maybe I'm using color to get my idea across. And then you can just ask that question again. Well, how am I using color? Um, you can look at specific examples in your work uh, as a way to help answer that question. So, um, if we move to the next slide, I have one with a little bit of an example, um, just so it gives you an idea of um, how basic and simple this can be to start. So for what, you know, what do you make? I was looking at the painter Maude Madsen um, and just trying to describe her work using this framework. Um, so she's making paintings, they're self-portraits. Um, they include imagery from her childhood home. Um, and then why? Um, she talks about insecurities, awkwardness, you know, those kinds of feelings that you might feel as a young girl growing up in your body. Um, and then how? And, you know, I started looking at her work and um, thought about how um, these adult bodies are kind of squeezed into the picture frame. Um, inhabiting these childhood spaces without a lot of room to feel comfortable. So that seemed to me to get, you know, that why across pretty well. But these are just very basic bullet points. And if you um, spend maybe a couple minutes or so jotting down key points for each heading, then you'll end up with some solid uh, language that you can kind of piece together and build upon and craft into a statement. So I want everybody to kind of pause for a minute and think about your own work, um, jot down some really simple bullet points. And then after a minute or two, if you're comfortable, I would love for you to type it in the chat. Um, there's no pressure here. Uh, so just know that this can be really, really basic. Um, there's no need for complete sentences even, or you know, no need for fancy words. Um, this is just a brainstorming activity to help you identify the key points in your work you know, and give you a place to start. So it's a helpful exercise whether you have experience writing an artist statement or, or you don't. Um, and even if you already have a statement, uh, this can help you make sure it's really on point. So maybe we'll spend just a couple of minutes um, and then see if anybody's willing to share here. Yeah, and we encourage you to, you know, just try doing quick bulleted items so that, you know, we can talk about it or provide feedback or sort of help you shape your next direction if you would like. So don't, you know, again, no pressure, but we're hoping that this is like, what will sort of spur you on uh, down your artist statement. Yeah, there so, are no wrong answers. That's right. We'll give you a few minutes. I said I would, you know, we could sing a song or something to <laughs> make the time go by. Or if anybody does have questions as we're going along, you're always welcome to put them in the group chat. Um, we can take a look at them and try to answer them in real time. So what, why, and how?
Okay, good. Yeah, I see one. Um, this first one's really nice. So uh, I see a, a nice, concise what, why, and how. Um, what, you know, being the subject matter, uh, the why being um, the emotion that you're trying to convey or, or the emotive quality, playful, approachable, fun, um, and then the how. So you're using color, you're using um, your environment. Um, so yeah, that's a very good example. Thank you for sharing. I see a couple more in here. Um, assemblage and found object art. I enjoy this medium and I refer to it as visual journaling. I kind of like that. Visual journaling. And then abstract weavings and with shapes and colors. I'm reacting to color combinations I see in my daily life. So influenced by your environment, um, you dye all the yarns to match the colors I find and then weave them together using a loom. So that's good. Great. What, why, and, and how you do it. Exactly. And so you can see like how simple these are. And we're not saying like this is your artist statement, but this is where you start. And then you start to pull these apart and say, you know, I'm making weavings because, and then continue to move on. And then, you know, how I'm doing it, what inspires me and, you know, how I'm embedding it into what I'm doing. So I think these are really good. Um, you're welcome to keep adding stuff in. Um, but maybe for time purposes, we'll, um, Keep, keep moving forward, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so you, you get hopefully the general idea and you can see how quickly you can map out something. Um, so when you uh, are just jotting down bullet points, um, you're hopefully getting um, to like the most important parts of your work uh, and you have um, the what, why, and how uh, just generally laid out, you know, and then you can take each component and expand upon it. Um, and then you can add more, you know, whys and hows if it's applicable. But uh, I think this is just a good entry point um, into what could seem like a complex task. So um, on the next slide, I think I just have a couple of resources. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple books that I find helpful personally. Um, so the first one I have here in my studio, um, this is a, a pretty nice, like concise pared down guide. Um, and it's nice because it gives ex a lot of examples and some anecdotes from um, professionals in the industry. And then um, the second one here, which has got a great title. Um, this one's much more comprehensive and uh, it gets into um, everything from creating an artist statement to doing your taxes, you know, so it's a really good tool to have on hand. All right, so that's artist statements, um, and I think I can toss it back over to you now. Okay, so um, I'm going to go into more of the where to start uh, for a proposal. So we're, we're kind of skipping forward. And, and because I read a lot of these and because a lot of it is actually very similar to what the sort of framework is that you're starting for your statements, um, you're going to be doing a very similar thing for a proposal or a project or a, a grant. You definitely want to go back to this what, why, and how um, 
because in a proposal and um, when, you know, I see a lot sometimes where artists have created their bio and they've created their artist statement and then they kind of just like sort of sneak their artist statement in as the proposal. And I think many times if you're trying to stand out, you are you're tailoring what your project might be to what you're applying to. So you don't want to just say, well, this is what I do and that's what I want to keep doing for this. Artist residencies and exhibitions are ways in which you can present your work and maybe push your artistic practice. And I know that, and I'm speaking from Akron Soul Train specifically, we're looking for artists who are trying to take their art practice one more level. So if you're just saying the same thing as your artist statement, it doesn't look like you've put some thought into like actually expanding your practice or trying something new or adding an element you've never added before. That's kind of what you want to get into when you're thinking about the what, the why, and the how. So what are you interested in creating? What are universal themes? And when I say universal theme, I mean something that like emotionally connects with a lot of people. So I saw earlier that somebody had put in the chat that they make art using discarded or useless material from trash. And we all, given the situation with the environment today, can relate to that. So there's something that you can pull out of that to help um, make it emotive for somebody who's reading it because they might be interested in that very thing that you're trying to present. So you want to think about universal themes that are kind of going through your work. What materials do you use and why? What excites you? And what have you learned through your process? These are kinds of things that you want to sort of weave into your project proposal. And why is it important to you? When you start to talk about something passionately, something that's meaningful to you, it comes through in your work. So um, you want to talk about why this is important to you and why it's important to share it with others, because you're not just creating art in a vacuum or in a bubble, you're creating it so we can present it to others. So why is that important? And then why did you choose the materials, the approach, this presentation, and, and demonstrate the value in why an organization should show your work? It's a little bit of pitching yourself. It's sort of, you know, some artists are like, oh, I don't want to sell myself. But it is you selling the passion you have about the project you're doing. It's not selling. It's it's getting someone to be interested in your story and wanting to share it with others. That's what I try to say. And then the how is like, how will you bring these ideas to life? You know, if you're um, trying to like, make much larger work than you've ever made before and you have time constraints, how are you going to manage those? How will you present your project? Are you typically a 2D artist and now you want to do installation? Maybe you want to, uh, going back to the environmental art, maybe you want to fill the entire gallery with trash, you know, like you want to think about how you're going to like push the practice and what you're going to be doing to like present this idea. And then your timeline, like what does it look like during your residency? What are you, what are your goals to accomplish while you're there? So, and then, you know, so on the right-hand side here, I have like, you know, craft your narrative, review your application, um, review the guidelines and tailor your writing to the submission or project. This is really important because a lot of times they'll have instructions underneath each of these applications, like what they want to hear. And you really want to make sure that you're giving them exactly what they're asking for. So if it's like, a, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little later, but if it's a three-part question in one, you want to make sure that you're hitting every part of those questions. All three questions are answered in that paragraph. So you do want to pay attention and follow the guidelines. Start by organizing your files, you know, just making sure you have a folder with artist statements of different various lengths and proposal statements and photos of your work. And another thing that we're not going to get into today, but understanding a budget, like how are you going to, with the stipends you're given, 
produce the work that you're saying you're going to produce in this proposal? And is it feasible? Because if it seems like you're putting together this proposal that there's no way you're going to be able to do financially with the budget that they're giving you or the stipend or whatever, you, you might automatically be taken out of the running. So make sure that you're thinking about budget and feasibility with your project, given the timelines or the constraints that these organizations are providing to you up front. Um, I think all of those are keys on where to start. And then I would, and I mentioned this already before, but to stand out, you really want to establish a connection. You're telling a story to me, the reader, and you want to engage me emotionally and um, you want me to feel your passion and your sincerity for what you're trying to convey. Um, you know, going back to conciseness and uh, avoiding overly ornate language is really important. I have read so, so many, um, you know, applications, even when I was at CIA and, and now in my role as executive director. And it is true that sometimes I read things and it's so beautiful, but I don't understand what the person is saying about their artwork. <laughs> the writing is amazing, but I still don't understand what it is they're trying to convey. So I think it's just brevity is your friend. Um, and, you know, you do want it to, to drill down into your idea, but in a really nice and clean and clear way. Um, edit and proofread. I've definitely had proposals come where the wrong organization was listed. So that's, that goes back to Katie's thing. Don't copy and paste, like make sure you can copy and paste a few things and get things in there, but just please edit and proofread and spell check and proper grammar and all of those things, because you just never know if it comes down to you and one other person. And you know, we have seven people that review. Somebody might say, well, I don't know. It didn't look like it looked, they looked rushed. And wh what would they be like to work with? And, you know, you, you just have no idea what these reviewers are going to say. And, and that's also when I go back to like being clear and concise, you also don't know who your reviewers are. They might not be, um, art history, you know, aficionados, they might just be normal people and you use need to use like mainstream language so that people can understand what you're saying. And then I would say develop templates or sound bites that you can constantly go back to and sort of pull from um, and make sure that they kind of all have these like key elements of your proposal. And, you know, again, I, I, I talk about efficiency and you do want to have like sort of reusable components, especially if you're applying to many residencies that are all kind of similar, you do want to be able to reuse stuff and not have to rewrite every single time. So I'm not saying you can't do that. You just want to edit and proofread and make sure that you have the right organization name in when you're submitting your proposal, um, because that will easily get you uh, down the list of um, artists for consideration. So I'm going to, I have three artist statements here. And I'm going to read them out loud. And then in the chat, I would like you, and there's no right or wrong answer here, but I would like you to tell me what you think of these three um, sort of hit that mark of meeting emotionally, giving you the full statement and feeling passionate about it. So you can choose A, B, or C. So A is I'm a painter who primarily depicts mushrooms in the environment due to their interesting patterns and colors. I find mushrooms are often undervalued and overlooked. I abstract the background and paint with thick layers to capture their three-dimensional quality. That's A. B, as an amateur mycologist, I spend a lot of time foraging for mushrooms. This requires deep observation and attentiveness to the landscape, and it has changed the way I interact with nature. Studying mushrooms is a great way to shift one's focus, to slow down, pay attention, and be present. Through the process of uh, photogrammetry, I scan polypore conch fungi around in the forests of Colorado and create 3D models of their fruit bodies. These models are customized to fit speakers and 3D printed. That's B. And then C, in my art, I explore the profound depths of my mushroom fascination, a journey into the enigmatic world of fungi that transcends the limitations of mere visual representation. My work challenges conventional notions of aesthetics. I reject the constraints of traditional artistic principles, opting instead for a chaotic and haphazard approach to my canvas. So of these three, A, B, and C, 
just I'm taking a poll, which ones resonate with you? Like which one sounds the most interesting that you might want to go see? Um, so I'm getting a lot of B's and C's here. C's and B's. Nobody liked A? <laughs> um, no, that's great. So uh, A, the painter has a lot of raw passion. Okay, B is the show I want to go see in person. Uh, B, combo of description of art and creating emotional interest. B, passion and specific. Um, so again, there are no wrong and no wrong answers here because they all do exactly what we're talking about. They all have the what, the why, and the how. But as you can see, a majority of the people were leaning towards B and C. And so, so that I can just be very transparent, A and C are the ones I wrote. I just made them up. And B is actually one from an artist who I admire, Ben Kinsley, who does live in Colorado and makes a sound work using 3D printed um, mushrooms. And they play sound that he has recorded in the forest. And it's really interesting. But I thought what I loved about his statement and why I chose it and why I wrote the other two to kind of go along with it is because he starts not to say in my art, or I am an artist, he starts with as an amateur mycologist. So doesn't even talk about the fact that he's an artist at all. But, and then he talks about how his world has changed because of the observations he's been making in nature. And then now he wants to apply that to his art practice and present that to the viewer. And I think there is a really nice, um, like, emotional connection that you make with this. And, and I think his passion for mushrooms come out very clear in what he's saying. So I love the way that he wrote this without saying like, I'm an artist or in my art, I do this. He started with something completely different, which is why I wanted to show, show it. Um, so again, they all do the same thing. They all meet those requirements and they all can work. So again, there is nothing wrong about any of these statements, but it's just which one resonates with you. And you might say, well, I didn't like B at all because it wasn't, you know, it, it's too much for me. I liked A because it got right to the point. And so if that's the kind of artist that you are, then that is the kind of artist statement you should be leaning towards. And that's what this exercise is about. It's about you looking at artist statements of other artists and saying, what do I like in this? What do I not like? Maybe this is too flowery. That has too many big words. I like, you know, I want something direct and to the point. Then that is the kind of statement you should be making for yourself. This goes back to that being honest with yourself and being honest in how you're presenting your work. So, um, you know, I just want to be clear. Oh, Natalie's curious, Nick and Katie, which of these three are you you into? I personally like B because it's very um, descriptive and I can paint a clear picture in my mind of what um, he's talking about with his work. Yeah, I agree. I like B. Um, I mm. get uh, kind of tired of um, statements always st starting out like in my work. Um, so it's just nice to have a refreshing um, opening. Um, and I think it uh, has the most um, specificity, but there's also, um, you know, a little bit of emotion there, which is nice. Um, a is like to the point, but maybe not quite as um, engaging. C, um, it uh, seems really passionate, but isn't very specific. So I kind of like B. It's a good combination of it all. So um, just to go through some quick tips, tricks, and best practices, these are things that I think about when I'm writing. I, obviously, I always go back to the passion. Be passionate about what you're doing. It's going to translate to the work you do in the studio, as well as the work that you're going to put on paper when you're writing about your ideas. Um, relatable themes is important because, again, you're you're sometimes speaking to a committee and you want someone on that committee to like think, yeah, that's what I want to see, this work. Um, 
know the why of your project. Why should it be funded and how will it benefit the community? I mean, I've had artists say, well, it should be funded because it's amazing. And that is what they've written before. And that isn't going to win you, you know, the spot in that, um, you know, in that residency or on that grant. You really need to talk about how it would benefit the community or why you keep doing it because it's so important to you. Um, again, going back to grammar, being concise. And this is really important. If you're denied, apply again. A lot of people think, well, I didn't get it the last time, so I'm not going to apply again. And I know that a lot of these residencies might have a small fee because they have to pay for the technology to capture these applications. And so sometimes that's not feasible. Maybe only pick two or three or, you know, or ask, you know, can I get some feedback on things I can update next time? You can always do that. Um, and, and they should provide you with some feedback on things that you can change. So I would say apply again, even if you didn't get it, 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 cause like, just to give you an example, we had 90 some applications for Akron Soul Train and we could only accept 15. So you might have been the 16th person. You have no idea. So, you know, you want to make sure that you apply again. Tricks. Um, this is something I do. Uh, I research who's going to be the juror <laughs> or the reviewer. And if you know and you learn what interests them, maybe you can tailor your the way that you talk or or some of your ideas to them, or you apply for things like a juried competition because you know the person who's selecting the work and you know the kind of work that they make or like, you might have a chance of getting in. So do your research. That That's always very helpful. Uh, I love the phone a friend that Katie said, same thing. If you're having trouble writing, like you just say, gosh, writer's block, I don't know where to start. Sometimes it's easier for us to communicate just by talking. So I would do set up a video, have a friend interview you, and then you can use the notes to transcribe your interview as a starting point if you need to go that route, if you're really like, I don't know where to start. Because sometimes we all have that. Even you might pull up the screen and see the blinking cursor and be like, ah, this is too overwhelming. So sometimes it's helpful to just say it out loud and then transcribe it. Um, and you're also a visual artist. You create things with your hands. So some people just have better time rather than typing on the computer, just hand write your ideas, like quick bullet points, you know, that might be an easier way and just let it free flow. And then you can go back and again, sort of pull out the little tidbits that you think are really important. So that's just another trick I might suggest for someone who's having trouble with writer's block. Read other artist statements. What do you like? What do you think works well? What don't you like? I can't say this enough. I mean, I always am reading artist statements because I'm always interested in how other people present their work. So I think um, it's helpful when you're in the museum and read what a curator says, you know, <laughs> what are they writing about this work? I'm curious to see how somebody else frames somebody's ideas. I think that's very helpful. And then Best practices, you know, when crafting a project proposal, respond accurately to the narrative questions, particularly if they have multiple parts. I know I mentioned that before, but really you want to make sure that you are following the application exactly how it's presented. Avoid unnecessary repetition in your proposal, and then ensure that you submit your proposal well before the deadline to avoid last minute rush and potential errors. Um, I have had a lot of people call me or email me at 1 a.m. and say, something crashed, I couldn't get my proposal in. And that's probably not what happened. It probably timed out because it closed at whatever, you know, 12 midnight or whatever it was, you know. And um, so I would just say, turn it in the day before it's due so that there's no error, there's no issue with technology, maybe Wi-Fi, you don't know, a storm could hit your house, your Wi-Fi could be out, you, could be having, you just never know what's going to happen. So best practice is to turn it in a little bit early, um, you know, not at 11.59 when it's due. Um, okay, moving on. So what will I be doing for my residency that pushes my current practice? This is one thing that I like really kind of try to, you know, hammer home because at, it's particularly for Akron Soul Train, let's say you're applying for a, a residency with us. We are very interested in artists who want to push their practice or try something experimental and new because that 
you don't often get that opportunity as an artist. And this is what a lot of residencies are for, because typically when you're making art and you're working with a gallery, you know, the gallery expects that you're going to be maybe selling your work or, you know, that there's some com kind of uh, commodification of your, you know, your artwork. Whereas we're not really looking for that. What we're looking for is experimentation and people to be creative and push because that's what makes your work grow. It's what makes you develop skills as an artist. And so that's really what we're looking for. So thinking about why this residency will push my practice is important and you want to write that into your proposal and then why it's important and what will it do for the community. And if you're looking at certain residencies and you're trying to match like what well what is it that they're trying to do like read our mission our mission is to basically connect also with the community so not only are we encouraging creativity and experimentation we also want to draw the community into art and make it accessible even if it is something experimental we want you know so there is in our proposal artists have to write like what they might do for one community engaged, like, you know, program. And, um, you know, I could name a few that artists have done, but, you know, it's, it's basically coming up with one program that helps people understand your art. So for example, let's go back to the, my, the amateur mycologist. What if your community engagement was to work with Summit Metro Parks and have somebody lead a, a mushroom hunt? <laughs> and that was what you did as your community project. And then your gallery show is the experimental artwork that you've done. And so there you've taken maybe a new group of individuals who don't really know much about art or maybe aren't interested in art, but they love nature. And you've now connected them to something that you also love. And now you're going to get them in the gallery after going on out in nature and being, you know, as inspired by, you know, mycelium, whatever. Um, so you know, that's one component of ours. I'm not saying every residency or any grant or exhibition or call for art is going to have that. I'm just saying, read the guidelines to make sure that you know what this organization is looking for. So that's just one example, because obviously I, I know what our application is about. Um, how will I pull together my residency work? What additional resources might be needed? Because you might say, yes, I get the thousand dollars. Yes, you're going to help me with my community program, but I really don't have these special lights that I need. Is there a way that I, these are some other things I might need in addition to the stipend you're giving me. And, and that would factor in. Obviously, you don't want to ask for the moon, but we might be able to find an organization that could we could borrow something from. We might be able to find you a studio to do the work in if you need like a special printing press or if you need, you know, so you want to make sure that you might want to write those additional resources in. Um, again, I keep going back to the community because, again, we're we're not just making work in our studio. We are presenting it. So why is it important that somebody come and see it? And then how will this residency benefit your artistic process or career? We ask that question. So I'm just telling you that is a question we specifically ask why this residency and what will it do to advance your career? So these are things you need to think about as you're going into an application. And then for a brainstorm session, just for yourself, if you're like, well, I do want to apply, but I don't know exactly what I want to do. So you want to compile a list of projects or artworks that you've been thinking about creating or something different you've wanted to always try with your work. And then you want to reflect on what moves, motivates, inspires, incites passion in you, maybe angers you, <laughs> things that other people might relate to. Um, consider creating art that emphasizes these things, these motivations, these passionate moments, um, because that is going to kind of create the best work. And then, um, you know, Another thing that Akron Soul Train is very big on and, and one thing that really um, we also celebrate and wish more artists would think about is like collaborating opportunities. So um, if you're an artist, again, going back to the mycology thing, you know, if you were to say like, what I'd really love to do is partner with the Summit Metro Parks, we might be like, oh, look, we could collaborate. <laughs> so um, these are little tips 
tricks you might want to put in if, if you know of an organization who might be willing to collaborate or if you've already had a conversation with an organization, put it in because we're always looking to collaborate with partners. And it's um, so that's something to think about when you're thinking about the kind of projects you're putting together. Always discuss your ideas with friends or colleagues to pinpoint areas where your projects could be strengthened and take that advice. You know, it is hard sometimes to get feedback. You feel criticized sometimes, but I would just like open your heart and let people tell you exactly what they are thinking without taking it too personally, because it will strengthen what you're doing. Um, <laughs> and at Akron Soul Train, and this isn't everywhere, but a lot of places you can call and talk to them about your ideas and they can provide some feedback and some direction for you. And Meryl and I are always happy to talk with people before they submit a proposal on ways to strengthen their proposal. That doesn't guarantee you're going to get a residency with us, but we certainly would help try to position you um, as best we could knowing what your project is and knowing the kind of people we have looking at the work. So we could get you a little bit closer. If you ever want to sit down and talk with us, we would be happy to do that. And then last, uh, again, I, I think I just can't kind of keep, um, you know, going, uh, hammering this all in, but um, fine tune your artist statement and bio, brainstorm, research, don't forget to put together a budget. Oh, take high quality images, apply more than once and create, obviously creating artwork is like the number one thing you need to be doing. So create, write, research and write more. And then I'll end on some resources that I have. If you are somebody who is interested in residencies, you're looking for opportunities, the Alliance of Artist Communities is a very um, comprehensive list of residencies um, around the, I don't know, I, I think they have internationally um, listed residencies. I've never looked too deeply into all of their residencies. Um, Katie mentioned New York Foundation for the Arts, so I put that in there as well. And you can look up Open Call for Art. Um, they have exhibition opportunity, they have residencies. And then locally, for those of you who are in this area, Arts Now has opportunities and they're always posting artist opportunities. So I would get on their mailing list. Uh, you can get on our mailing list. I try to send out artist opportunities once a month to anyone who gets on our mailing list and checks that they're an artist. I try to send that out so you know what's going on. Jobs, internships, you know, exhibitions, open call for art. I try to send that out when I can see it. And then if you're a Cleveland Cuyahoga resident, you know, you would want to look at Assembly for the Arts, assemblyclee.org. And then there's also Northeast Ohio Art Opportunities. And this is, um, I just found it the other day, um, neo.opportunities.art. Um, and it is a big comprehensive list of things that are happening in and around Northeast Ohio. So I would definitely get on there um, to look around and see what you can find to apply to. And so now I'm going to pass it over to Nick. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk more about the artist perspective. So what to expect, what to um, look for, and how to prepare your portfolio. So first, we're going to start with the do's and don'ts of photographing your work. Since you created this um, gorgeous artist statement that Katie and Peta have helped you create, you're going to need a strong portfolio to match. So these are three examples of what not to do. Starting with the first one on the left, you have your piece on the floor surrounded by a bunch of unrelated um, objects. You know, if I would have opened this, this would tell me that you're disorganized and that you don't take the application very seriously. Um, you want whoever looks at your portfolio to focus solely on your work. Um, so moving on to the photo in the middle, that's a jump scare. <laughs> you, I'm sure that you all are proud of your work and are beautiful people, but please do not hold your work in your portfolio. And I know that's quite silly to bring up, but Peta has mentioned that she sees photo like photos like this in people's portfolios. So just just be aware of that. Um, and then lastly, we have this photo on the right. They got their 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 piece on the wall, which is like five points. But there's three things that are wrong with this photo. 
First, their piece is crooked. Make sure that your painting is straight on. Um, next, it's too dark. You can boost that or have lights to enhance your photo. And then lastly, it's very blurry. You spend all this time creating your, your, your pieces. You want to accurately depict that with the photos that you take. So we can move on to the next slide. And just really quick, I want to interject the one on the left where the painting is leaning against the other frames. I might also get confused and think that you want to do an installation with your painting and other frames against the wall. So like if that isn't part of your artwork, don't put it in. Right. So these are the do's. So if you have a 2D work uh, mounted on the wall, make sure it's um, placed on a neutral color. Um, and that you have the image sharpened and that your colors accurately depict um, your piece. 3D work, pretty much the same. Make sure it's on a neutral background. Um, some photo tips that I use. I prefer natural lighting. Um, the best time to photograph, in my opinion, is in the morning when the sunlight isn't too harsh. Or you could also do it during sunset. Um, photo editing, I like to use Photoshop. Um, you can get like a $10 subscription, but I know not everyone can do that. So you can check out um, your local library or university, and hopefully their multimedia studio has Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, I know Kent State offers this, and it's free to the public. Um, or you can use a website called Pixlr, which is basically like Photoshop, but it has less features. Um, so yeah, so we can move on to the next slide. Finding resources. So I like to be transparent when I find a lot of my opportunities. It's through Google. Google's my best friend. Make Google your best friend when finding opportunities. Um, your searches don't have to be too complicated. They can be artist residencies due March 2024. And they'll give you a bunch of websites that will have upcoming deadlines for you to, <clears throat> to, to do. And um, have a good network of artists. Um, it's really, really important that you get to know your community because although that artists compete with each other, we also uplift one another. So um, it's great to have a good group of friends who are also related in the arts and they share stuff on social media that you can see um, and apply for. You know, I got to go to um, Dublin, Ohio for their exchange program from Arts Now um, in the Dublin Arts Council because my friend Grace Carter works at Arts Now and recommended me. So sometimes uh, you will find opportunities and sometimes they will find you. You know, my first artist residency I found through pretty much Indeed because I found a job there as a host at the Lighthouse Immersive Van Gogh exhibit. And I later found out that they had an artist residency. So you never know what might happen. So it's great to stay optimistic. Um, and if a, uh, an organization ha hasn't updated their website on a residency cycle, don't be afraid to reach out to them and be like, hey, I'm interested in this program. I wanted to know when the next application cycle is. And usually they're happy to help you. And I've done that before. And usually they say, no, not nothing right now but they remember you and then you get to work with them in the future, hopefully. And so move to the next slide. And, and sorry, one more thing to add on to that. It, when it, it, as it applies to grants too, if you know the funder, it's always helpful to like reach out to them and talk to them about a grant. If they have like an individual artist grant to get to know them and get your name out there before you submit is it's very helpful. Right, make a good impression. And lastly, here are some questions to consider. Um, these are the questions that I consider when I apply for a residency. First, is there a stipend? You know, um, stipends are here to support and um, help us survive as artists. We definitely need these as if we take time away from jobs. So make sure that if you apply for something that they give you money or, yeah. Or next, is there a supply stipend? You know, a supply stipend is a cherry on top of a residency Sunday, you know? So <laughs> not all residencies have a supply stipend, but they're 
they're great and they don't affect your regular artist type art artist stipends. So I did a residency this past fall at Fever Dream located in Cleveland and they gave me a supply stipend along with an artist stipend and that helped me get the materials, the paints I needed, um, plus wacky things like colored lights and I even bought um, a Japanese mask straight from Japan. So those are just extra bonuses to help you. Um, next, is there a studio? So if you are working out of your bedroom or your basement, you are gonna need to find a residency that can give you a space to create the work that you need to. Um, next, is there housing? This one's important when you apply for a residency that um, is out of state because you can't sleep in the studio if they give you a studio. So make sure that there's somewhere for you to sleep. <laughs> and then next, uh, past residents. I always like to look at who the past residents were. Um, is your work strong enough um, like theirs or vice versa? And this can also help you just feel more confident when you apply. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to the past residents. I've had people DM me and ask me my experience at Fever Dream, and I'm happy to give my honest experience. And usually people are. Um, the worst thing people can do is leave you on red or tell you to buzz off. <laughs> and next, what is the organization slash program background? So is this a respected organization? Um, do they treat their artists well? That's really important because you don't want to feel embarrassed to be associated five years or 10 years down the road. And a newer residency isn't worse than an older residency. Um, just make sure they treat you well. And yeah, that's pretty much. <laughs> and then lastly, how does this program service me? So residencies are here to, here to help you take you to the next stage of your artistic career. Um, so you have to really think about what are you looking for right now? Are you looking for a stipend? Are you looking for a studio to create the work? Are you looking for um, a larger network of artists to be associated with? Are you looking for a little vacay so you can go to the hills of North Dakota? Like these are all things that you should be thinking about. And if a residency doesn't offer one of these, then maybe that's the wrong residency for you. Um, and lastly, like Peter said, always keep applying. Um, if you don't get the second time, apply for the third time, you know? Um, and make sure that you have a Google Doc that has all the residencies that you applied, all the ones that are your, you're waiting to open, and lastly, all the ones you've been rejected and um, you're waiting to apply again. Like all of that's really great to keep moving forward. Be like a shark and always move on to the next project. That's what I say, and that's what you should do. All right, thank you. I think that's the end of that. Um, I love that. That's that's a great um, tip is like, because I do this for, I write a lot of grants for Akron Soul Train, and I do have what I call a grant pipeline. And it's just an Excel doc that tells me what, what I should be doing that month. So if you're getting ready to gear up for a residency or some other thing, you can start to put something very simply together, you know, like that, that allows you to kind of keep on time and know when the deadlines are to apply for things. Um, I think that's really helpful. So our emails are here on this page. Uh, we are totally happy to um, get and re receive questions from you um, if, if you don't feel like um, asking any questions right now, but we did save some time here at the end um, to answer any questions or if you want to share anything with us, um, you know, again, we're happy to look over uh, statements, give you some feedback if you would like. Um, that's something that we we talked about doing. So if everybody has had time to take our email addresses down, I will go ahead and stop share. And I can always put these in the chat if you haven't. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, so we can open it up for questions. If anybody has questions, go ahead and unmic and just ask questions. Otherwise we'll give you back almost 10 minutes 
of your evening. Um, Hi, I'm Sue, and I've got a question. Yeah. Everything I've seen so far for artist statements, um, they always start with um, she or he. They refer to the, the artist in the uh, third party. And I'm just wondering, is that like an absolute or, or if you have any thoughts about that versus um, the individual's voice? If you're talking artist bio, um, that's generally in the third person. If when you're saying, when you're talking about an artist statement, that's generally I, PETA, am mm -hmm. talking about my artwork. So I would say like, I do this or I, you know, like, so it's more like that. If, is that what you're asking? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so, so the bio is typically in third person because um, a lot of times, let's say that you apply to Akron Soul Train and you get accepted for a residency. I sometimes take that bio and morph that with the artist statement and still kind of turn it all into the third person because I'm going to send it out to like a news outlet to say, you know, for our press release. Oh. So that's a lot of times why the bio is helpful to be just in third person because it usually gets sent out a lot, like about the artist, you know, so-and-so went to Kent State University and got an MFA, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's usually in the third person, but not the statement. That's usually not in the third person. Thank it, you. It, Katie, does that sound right? I don't want to be misleading. Yeah, yeah, it does. And um, I think um, oftentimes, uh, like maybe I'll send a statement that I write in the first person to um, a gallery for a show, and then they will kind of rewrite it and, and put it into their press release, and they'll put it in the third person because they're sending it out um, to their network kind of on behalf of, of me. So that's probably why um, you see some in the, in the third person, because um, they've probably just gone through that extra step. But if you're writing an artist statement directly, you can write it in the first person. Thank you. It was very confusing because sometimes I'll say it one way and sometimes it's the other. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good question. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, I had a quick one. So I don't know if this is real or not, but does not having an MFA or BFA like limit me from any artist opportunities that I might apply for? Like, are they gonna just like throw my application in the trash if they don't see those letters or what? No, <laughs> it does not limit you at all. If you have a really okay. good idea and your writing about your proposal is, is exceptional and it's interesting and intriguing, honestly, we even went away from this because I think it was, um, we we actually moved to optional CV. We don't even require a res like a CV when you apply to Akron Soul Train for this very reason because there were people that weren't applying. I think very similarly saying, "Well, I'm not formally educated as an artist, so I'm not going to apply because I don't have a list of exhibitions." Or I mean, maybe you do have a list of exhibitions, but I don't have the yeah. credentials, you know. And so we decided to move away from that. It's more right. about like what your ideas are and showing your work. So if you're somebody who's producing, um, no, I don't think, at least for me, that's not going to limit you. Maybe some other organizations will put must have or need or, but I, I don't think so. What do you think, Katie and Nick? Yeah, I don't think it limits you. Um, there might be, you know, some uh, opportunities that uh, do require um, a degree. I think it's pretty rare though. Um, especially now, I think a lot of um, organizations have kind of moved away from it. Um, I I see age requirements more often than degree requirements nowadays for residencies. Um, but yeah, I think um, no matter what you're applying for, uh, the work is the most important thing, you know, and, and it you can have no degree, you can have a degree in like biology, um, or whatever, but if your work is really strong, um, then you should have every opportunity. And I would agree too. I think that it helps you, but it's not necessarily needed. And a lot of them don't require or have that requirements um, put on their um, application. And yeah, like Katie said, if they do, it's pretty rare. Piggybacking off of that, do you think it's important to say I am self-taught or just not say anything at all? 
Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, deter. I mean, it's okay to say I'm self-taught, like you, you could say my, or just say my interest is in this, you know, like I, I don't think it's necessary to highlight it. You don't have to, you can just say, I have been working in my studio for X number of years, you know, and it's, that's actually pretty committed, you know, like, so there's ways mm -hmm. to spin it through language that doesn't say like, yeah, I didn't get a degree in art. <laughs> you know? True. I mean, strangely, my degree is in biology and not art. So <laughs> thank That's you for like... the, the, the shout out there. <laughs> That's exceptional. Um, I saw a chat question, which is, are there some resources on artist CVs that you'd recommend? I have my first application soon that needs one. Um, Katie or Nick, do you want to field that question? Yeah. <laughs> um, so these books are really helpful. Uh, they do have um, a, a way to format your CV and what to include, um, how to organize it, and they have examples. Um, so I would recommend checking them out. I know the, um, the GIST book, is online too, so you don't have to buy the book. You can you can Google it, and there are some online resources. Um, so that's one. Uh, Nick, do you have any that you go to? Or, um, sorry, what was the question again? For um, CVs. For CVs, I usually just check out other artists' websites. Honestly, you can go on social media and look up your favorite artists, and usually they have their website listed. And I think that's a great reference to look at. That's good. Yeah, I agree. And is it Che Jeffries says, I know we should definitely have a bio, but do you think we sh you should have your artist statement on your website? I think that's up to you, but I do think it's helpful for people to understand your philosophies and your art practice, which is what that artist statement is about. So if your work um, needs some explanation or you want people to know um, more deeply what you're working on, then yes, I think you should have an artist statement. And the nice thing about your website is your artist statement can be as long as you want it. <laughs> if you think somebody mm -hmm. has the bandwidth to read it and you want to put a really long statement, you can on your website. But as we mentioned before, some applications do have requirements on word count. So I do want to let you know to keep that in mind that you should have a long, a medium, and a short statement uh, that you might need to use in different situations. But yeah, I would say definitely put it on your website. Can I chime in on that too? Mm -hmm. I will say for curators who are, um, you know, like pulling together a group exhibition, A, having a statement on your work might help lead them to you. So if you have those keywords, then if they're searching certain things, you might come up easier, A. And B, it might also show, you know, your ability to write a statement can sometimes help position you in a, in a certain way with, you know, certain opportunities if someone is seeking you out. So that those are two reasons, I think, why having it on there is a benefit. Obviously, if you're changing it a lot, then, you know, that might be a reason not to. But um, I think I think I don't see a problem with having it on there. I don't see a downside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I feel like, well, speaking of like long artist statements, I feel like mine is pretty busy. And I think a big part of that has to do with like having a lot of different ideas and still um, like forming my voice. Um, and like, while all of that's happening, like while like you're figuring out your own stuff, like how do you recommend like deciding what's important for your artist statement if you're in like a state of like purgatory kind of? That was a lot of words. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? Definitely. I'm going to toss that to Katie. Yeah, um, I totally get it. Uh, and um, if you are feeling like maybe you've got um, a bunch of different ideas or, you know, some different bodies of work um, and you're having trouble um, 
getting a one cohesive statement, maybe you kind of work backwards a little bit and um, kind of take a look at like each tangent in your studio or like each body of work um, and maybe make a, a shorter, more specific statement about that. Mm -hmm. um, or even just like jot down things, um, bullet points. And then maybe you can look at those um, few different paragraphs um, and there will be common threads, you know, um, that come out of that. So it might be helpful to write a little bit more specifically about each idea and then just compare them all and then find those common threads and those you can expand upon for, you know, your, your bigger, more general statement. Um, yeah. That That's suggest. really good advice. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. I would say the same thing. Cause I feel like you can have a pretty broad statement that uses like very broad words that kind of cover a lot of different things. And I'm seeing in the chat, like somebody mentioned being a multimedia artist. Mm -hmm. uh, I am that. And so oftentimes when I work in one material, I might talk about my work in one way. And then when I work in another material, I might talk about my work in a different way. But if you heard the artist state or the statement about me as an artist, I usually just say, well, I'm a multimedia artist who uses this, 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 and this, which is all very broad terms. So sometimes a, just the broad and less specific can be helpful if you're just like, eh, I need to do this and get it out. But if you're being more specific for a, um, a specific need, like a residency or an exhibition, then you do need to like get back down to like what Katie's saying and be like super specific about whatever that idea is instead of trying to, you know, bring everything into the same statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. Anybody else have anything else to add? I guess I would like to ask something if no one else has anything. I wanted a real quick one. Go for it. Sorry. Um, how much work would you recommend having completed before trying to do a proposal? Um, if you're talking about like, okay, so we'll just talk about Akron Soul Train specifically. Um, if you have an idea and you haven't created work yet, that doesn't matter to me. You can put old work and say, well, here's what I've done in the past so that we have an understanding of like how you work as an artist and what your work kind of looks like. And then you can say, but for my residency, I'm going to do this. And um, you could have maybe sketches or ideas, but you don't have anything to page really, if you know, like, then that's okay for us. We actually don't expect you to have any of the work done. So, um, you know, but if you had one and you said, well, here's what I started with, but I want to expand on this idea. Like maybe if you have older work, that's like leading you towards this other work, then maybe you want to include that because it's going to be part of that story, but we don't specifically require that you have work done that you're going to be doing for our residency. Other residencies may be more specific. So maybe one or two pieces that you can show that say, this is the kind of work that I'll be creating might be good. Thank Any you. other thoughts on that, Nick? Cause you've applied to a lot of residencies. Yeah, I make sure I have at least around like 20 to 25 works that I'm really like um, passionate about. And it could be less than that, but usually it, it also depends on what the program, they will give you a certain amount of numbers um, that images you can apply with. Um, but it's it's great to have a wide range to pick from as well, I'll say. Something that I've noticed applying to things as well that's helpful is even showing some like earlier work that you may not be as like, whoa, like crazy proud of. But if you're able to show like, this is what I was making last year, but this is what I'm making now. I think that also shows like your willingness to learn and like move forward in your craft or however, you know, you're approaching um, your portfolio. I like that advice. 
I wanted to address Megan's question for exhibitions, and I think it really depends on the gallery as far as how much work you have done in your portfolio. I know uh, for our exhibitions in our proposal, we don't require any of the artwork for the proposal to already be completed. Um, I think again, as just to echo what Peta was saying, it's helpful to have work that kind of exemplifies what you would be creating. Um, but in general, if what you uh, what your artist statement has reflects the type of work that you're making and you can see a clear connection to the direction of the work, then I don't think it's necessary. I think it can be really helpful, especially if you're moving in a different direction. Like if I'm a curator, like how am I going to understand what the next step in this is if you don't have anything like that already? Does that make sense? I know some galleries do want to see how a body of work is coming together. So I think... It just depends on the gallery and if there is an application process it should specify if you if it requires um finished work in that body or not and if not i would just ask yeah always ask does that sound right with you katie yeah yeah, yeah it really just depends um but yeah always ask Yeah, and Jamie, that's correct. Like even for Akron Soul Train, um, we see, we say we only want like five pieces. You know, we don't want to see everything in your um, portfolio. So usually you got to like edit down what you think is the best representation of what you're doing or previously have done. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Well, it looks like we went over a few minutes, so I just want to wrap up with everyone. I want to say thank you again to Katie, Peta, and Nick for sharing all of your amazing expertise. Again, as someone who's also looking at, you know, a lot of proposals, I think all this just lands so perfectly with, um, you know, what I've experienced too. Uh, I did want to recap everything that we accomplished this evening because we did go through a lot. Uh, we discussed typical uh, writing elements and artist opportunity applications. We addressed writing obstacles and how uh, and some tips and tricks to overcome them, uh, types of artist statements, how to use them and what they include. Uh, we went over some tips on uh, writing artist statements, such as how to get uh, started writing one, how to start building a frame. And then we even started building a framework for our own artist statements, thinking about what, why, and how. And then we also used that framework of what, why, and how and applied it to artist applications. Also discussed tips on standing out in those applications especially um, how important it is to tell your story to really make sure that you're getting readers emotionally invested. Uh, so thank you again for everyone who joined us this evening. It was wonderful. I'll be sending out that follow email and uh, we hope to see you soon at another uh, Summit Arts Space program.